But I'm going to talk today about the impact of encoding on content delivery. Um, and this is a short talk. It's 20 minutes. There's a lot that I would like to talk about that I'm not going to get to, so I'm just going to kind of jump right in. Um, and we can chat more after to you if we want to. But really, the question I want to ask is this. How do you make video quality better? Hopefully, we're all invested in this in some way or another. Um, well, there's a couple different categories of approaches you can take. Um, you can improve video quality by using better technology. And you can use, improve video quality by using the technology you already have, but just doing, a, doing it smarter, doing a smarter job with what you already have. Uh, similarly, you can think about improving video quality from an encoding standpoint, and you can think about it from a delivery standpoint. Encoding is the bits themselves, once you have them on your hard drive, how do they look? Uh, delivery is sort of the end-to-end. -end. How does video look in the wild uh, on a real-world user with real-world bandwidth and uh, a real-world device? Um, if you plot these on a two-by-two -two matrix, uh, you'll get to kind of four things that we're going to talk about today. Um, so we're going to talk about improving video quality by using new and better codecs, improving video quality by encoding smarter with per title encoding, uh, improving video quality by delivering better quality to new displays with better capabilities, and then doing delivery smarter with QoE optimization. So uh, kind of the, gu the guiding goal for all of these approaches is this. You want to deliver more picture quality to real world users, and all of these are different ways of doing that. So I'm going to try to keep this pretty concrete and practical. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so we'll spend a little bit of time on the theory behind each of these, but really also try to focus on what, could, what can you actually do, what's the impact of what you can do, what's the cost, what are the trade-offs. So uh, let's get going. So better encoding with next-gen codecs. Um, do a really quick codec genealogy. A lot of this you probably already know, so I won't take too much time on this. Kind of the dominant codec encoding compression tree today is the MPEG tree. Uh, MPEG-2, H.264, HEVC, you're familiar with all these, I'm sure. Um, most video today in the world is encoded using uh, this sort of technology tree. Then there's the VPX tree. Uh, VP8 and VP9 are both used in the wild today, uh, used really widely by YouTube and a little bit less widely by other people. Um, there's this ZIF codec tree, uh, Theora and Dala, which I think actually forked out of the VPX tree back at like VP3 or something. I could be wrong about that, but I think it's like somehow has some tie in there, uh, but it's kind of gone its own way. There's this Thor codec that I don't really know anything about. Um, I couldn't find a logo, so I designed a logo. So if you're here and you work for Thor, you're welcome. Um, but uh, the interesting thing with these bottom three is that they're all feeding into the AV1 codec, which is kind of like a next, next gen codec. Um, that's really promising, really exciting, and still honestly a few years out from like really being ready for widespread use. So um, if you're talking about improving video quality today using next-gen codec, codecs, you're talking about these two, HEVC and VP9. Um, so how do they perform? Well, here is uh, some research that uh, Jan Ozer presented at Stream Media West last year. You can find the slides and the presentation online. Um, you probably can't see the details here, but the kind of bottom curve, th th this is uh, VMAF as a measure of video quality plotted against uh, bitrate for 4K content. The bottom line is H.264. The top three are next-gen codecs. It's two different implementations of H.265 and uh, one of VP9. And yeah, the next-gen codecs are like significantly better than H.264. Um, how much better if you... If you want to boil it down to a single number, you're probably talking about something like this, something like 30%. Uh, they aim at 50% bitrate reductions. In some circumstances, they get that, uh, they get that, but in others, they don't. So 30% is still pretty good. Uh, you could today deliver 30% smaller files to a lot of people um, using these codecs. Uh, that comes at a trade-off, and that trade-off is increased encoding cost. Um, think in terms of like maybe 5 to 15x more expensive to create video using these codecs, partly because they are more complex. You're applying more compute to get more compression, uh, and also partly because they're less well optimized. Um, H.264 has 15 years of like deep optimization, and it's really efficient uh, in, in a number of implementations, at least. So where can you use these codecs? Well, HEVC um, works in a couple of web browsers. But more interestingly, it works on 
new iOS devices, phones and tablets, um, as of iOS 11.2. So in the US, you can probably get to about a third of your mobile base with HEVC today. Uh, and it works on most TV platforms. All of the current generation TV platforms support HEVC, uh, and some of them going back a few generations as well. Um, out of curiosity, anyone here using HEVC in the wild? Anyone here using VP9 in the wild? So VP9 is kind of the opposite of HEVC in terms of uh, where you can use it. Um, there's actually pretty good support in browsers. So Chrome, Opera, Firefox, and Edge all support it. Those are all evergreen browsers, and they've supported it for Chrome for three or four years. I think Edge for like a year and a half. Um, I could be wrong on that. So you can get to most of your web traffic with VP9. Uh, mobile, <clears throat> quite a bit less. Um, although there is one interesting thing. If you were to fire up a mobile app on a current generation iPhone and go to a very large video sharing site. I'm not going to say the name in case I get in trouble, um, but just imagine a big video sharing site. That's probably the one. Uh, they're actually doing VP9 decoding in software. Um, so you can do VP9 anywhere that you have enough compute to, uh, to decode it. Um, and then on the TV front, VP9 support's not great. So. Um, so yeah, you could today be delivering better quality video using HEVC and VP9 to real devices for a real improvement offset by a real cost. So uh, that's the first technique we're going to talk about. Second one is doing encoding smarter using per title adaptation. Um, who here is familiar with per title encoding already? Raise your hand. A few. Um, so this introduces no new technology, no new standards, no new devices or codecs. It's just a smarter way of doing video encoding. It was pioneered by Netflix um, a few years ago, uh, but other people are doing it to you. Um, and sort of the fundamental principle here is that you can't really apply the same video encoding settings to two different videos and expect to get good results. Um, and he here's why. Uh, here I have two videos. I've encoded using X264 to a constant CRF, which basically targets a constant quality, chooses the right bit rate to get to that quality. Um, guess which one of these needs more bits? The left. Yes, it is the left. The left to get to CRF18, which is basically like pristine quality, 12.4 megabits. The right video, 3.4 megabits. If you apply the same video encoding ladder, adaptive ladder to these two videos, you're like necessarily doing something wrong. Um, so per title encoding solves this by identifying the right encoding ladder for every individual video. Um, here's, how, here's how it works. Uh, this is at least sort of the brute force approach. Um, you take two videos and you encode them to an array of widths and an array of bit rates. In this case, we probably did 100, 200 encodes for each of these two videos. Uh, and we measured the quality. We measured the quality using VMAF, which again is a uh, objective video quality uh, metric um, introduced by Netflix that performs pretty well. Um, and if you plot those on a three-dimensional graph, here's what you get. So here we have um, quality up and down and also indicated by color. Blue is good, green's okay, red is bad. Uh, and then we have bit rate and width. And you find this like interesting red line that kind of walks down this. And that red line is the optimal encode at any bit rate or at any resolution. So if you have, uh, with this particular video, if you have eight megabits of bandwidth, the optimal encode for that kayaking scene uh, is 720p. It's not even 1080p. You don't even want to do 1080p with this video. And as soon as you get to seven megabits per second of bandwidth, you're already dropping down to 540p being the ideal uh, resolution for that video. Um, let's look at the second video, that uh, sort of drone panning over a, a European city. Um, here's the optimal encoding ladder for that. Um, follow the red line. It actually looks best at 1080p all the way down to about 1.4 megabits per second, and then it drops a little bit from there. So if you flatten those out, these are the optimal bitrate ladders for these two videos. They're pretty dramatically different. Um, and it, hopefully this shows why you can't use the same, you can't use a static encoding ladder and expect to be doing things uh, anything close to the optimal way. 
Um, and I didn't just cherry pick these two videos. Here's 50 videos that we encoded to the uh, optimal encoding ladder and then kind of visualize the different resolutions in color. It's like they're all pretty different. Um, some videos need a very high resolution all the way, some need a low resolution, some have a steep curve, some have a shallow curve. Um, let's visualize it. Hopefully you can see the difference between these. This is that sort of drone uh, sky footage of, of a city. Uh, on the left, if you'd use the Apple recommended HLS static bitrate ladder at one megabit per second, you get that one. On the right, if you use the actual ideal per title resolution at that same bitrate, um, it's a pretty significant difference. I don't know if you can see it on the screen, um, but it makes a real difference. So what's the impact of per title encoding? Um, if you have to put a single number on it, I'd say it's about 20% in terms of quality or bitrate savings. Uh, it varies by content type. Um, some content types really, really uh, love this. Some, you know, the benefit's a little bit less. Uh, there's never, it's never worse. Like doing this is never worse than just using a fixed ladder. But sometimes the fixed ladder like kind of randomly guesses what's actually the right, the right ladder. Uh, what's the cost? Well, unfortunately the cost is about maybe 20x uh, the encode cost. Because if you do the Netflix approach, which is kind of brute force, you're gonna do 10 to 20 times as many encodes as you actually deliver. You might do 100 encodes to get to your seven that you actually wanna deliver in the wild. Uh, and then if you use VMAP as your quality metric, it's a pretty slow computationally intensive metric to you. Um, so this makes a lot of sense for premium content with a lot of views, uh, makes a big difference, no, uh, you know, doesn't require any new technology. Um, there is an alternative. Um, we've actually just, my company actually just released a machine learning version of this. Uh, we use a uh, kind of multi-layer neural network to uh, infer what is the right uh, convex hull of bitrate quality and resolution for a video. So instead of taking hundreds of compute hours, it takes like two seconds. Um, here's how it works. Um, I totally know what this means and I did not just get this from my data scientist. So uh, I'm just gonna let you read it for a second. Uh, if you wanna use it um, in production, um, just sign up for a free Mux video account, add a flag of per title encode true, and you will get a per title encoded video. You can use the API to pull out the full kind of convex hull if you want that information for your own video encoding. Um, and it's like machine learning. It takes like a second, so it doesn't cost anything extra. So if you want to do the full slow approach to this, it's uh, going to be perfectly accurate and it's expensive in terms of encoding. Uh, consider machine learning as an alternative um, and you can make it basically free, which makes it actually work for long tail content or things like that. Um, where does it work? Uh, it works everywhere. This does not have any like device uh, limitations, obviously. So you can improve all your video with this. So the third tactic we're gonna do is, uh, talk about is improving quality through better delivery to high pixel density displays. Um, I gotta go fast on these last two here. Um, but my MacBook here, uh, and probably your computer has the same thing, um, has this interesting distinction between logical resolution and physical resolution. Um, the logical resolution of my MacBook is 1440 by 900, but the actual physical resolution, the, the actual display panel, is 2304 by 1440. Um, this is because displays keep getting better in terms of number of pixels per inch, which allows you to display you know, more detail, crisper images. Um, but this separation is important for like backwards compatibility. If you try to like browse the web on a 4K display, it doesn't look very good because like, you know, the, the page itself is only taking a very small amount. So CSS actually implemented this thing where there's that, this, this distinction between the, um, what the browser thinks the resolution is and what the actual panel resolution is. And you can take advantage of this by delivering more pixels to a player than you think you maybe can. Um, you can't really see it well on the screen here, but if you go to mux-dpr.netlify.com, you can see a little page with two video players side by side. One is 540p video and a 540p window. One is 1080p video and a 540p window. And if you do it on a retina display or you know, a high pixel density display, you can see a pretty significant quality difference uh, between the two. Um, how, how significant? Well, we, we ran 10 videos, um, encoded 10 videos to 540 and 1080 at the same quality measured the VMAF between the two, um, and you can get 
say, between 6 and 23% higher quality by delivering to the actual capabilities of the display versus just the pixel count uh, in, in the browser. Um, comes at a cost. That cost is like 300% more bandwidth. You're delivering four times the number of pixels if you deliver 1080p video to a 540p display. Um, where does it work? It uh, works on every Mac is now Retina. I think most PCs are, but I don't have a number behind that. Um, every modern phone does this. Um, this is not a thing on TVs because TVs just like to advertise all you know, 4K of their pixels. They, they don't have this sort of artificially constrained lower resolution. So the last thing we're gonna talk about today is delivering smarter with QoE optimization. Um, and this, uh, I'm gonna go really quickly through this one uh, because uh, not a lot of time, um, but uh, you can think about quality of experience as having kind of four characteristics. Um, this, this is what a user, this is what can go wrong for a user when they watch a video. Uh, they can get a, see a failure, they can see slow start time, they can see rebuffering, or they can see a bad quality video, either in terms of the image or the audio. Um, and a good QE platform is going to help you first understand your performance on these and second pinpoint areas that you can improve. Um, and may, maybe, the, maybe the important thing to think about for this is that as you're changing your encoding, if you do implement new codecs or you try this like high DPR uh, you know, resolution thing or you try per title encoding, what you really care about is like the end result in the wild. What you really care about is are people actually seeing better quality video? Can they actually, uh, are they seeing lower buffering, less, lower startup time? So if you do these things, consider using QoE as sort of your control layer and like see what the real improvement is. Um, a couple of war stories, just real quick. Um, we worked with a company called IGN on a, a player upgrade. They used QoE metrics to first make a kind of buying decision about what player performed the best in the wild. And then second, to do really deep optimization. And they got some pretty significant improvements to all of these performance dimensions. Um, another customer, Wistia, um, went from progressive MP4 to HLS and really fine-tuned their ABR algorithm, and they estimate they dropped their bandwidth by 50% by doing that. Um, all of these things, like it's not just QoE alone doesn't do it, it's QoE plus your hard work, um, but it's really powerful if you, if you take the time. So what's the impact of QoE optimization? I don't know, it varies, but let's just say 10 to 50% improvement in sort of these performance dimensions. What's the cost? Um, Again, it varies based on what vendor you choose and like how big you are, but I don't know, here's some ballparks. Um, uh, and then where does it work? Works everywhere. This is not, again, not dependent on uh, technology, on devices or anything like that. So that's it. So we've talked about four ways of improving uh, video quality in the real world. Um, I kinda wanna put a summary slide up here that I don't know, it tries to quantify what, what works and how much everything works. So just for the sake of this summary slide, imagine this is your traffic distribution. Um, it's probably different. I probably underestimated mobile for some people. Um, but if that's your traffic distribution and if the other numbers in here are correct, here's like what you can do today to improve video quality, how much of improvement you can get, and what the cost is. Um, I don't know if you can, I don't know if that slide is visible in the back, but uh, I can share slides after this. Um, so per title encoding and QE are powerful because they affect everyone, every single one of your viewers. The others affect certain viewers based on device. Um, but um, yeah, you can do all these things today without waiting for AV1 or waiting for whatever it is uh, to get better quality. So that's it, thanks. I don't know if we have time for questions. If there's a question. How do you per title for live content? Ah, great question. How do you do per title encoding for live content? Um, this is something that we're working on right now, and I know a lot of other people are thinking about it too. Um, I'd say there's two main ways. One is you just do it really, really fast, and you adapt kind of like per scene, and you adapt just like a little bit behind live. So, uh, there's this, I didn't talk about this, there, there's a, there's per title encoding, which is like 
picking a better bitrate ladder for your video. Then there's like per scene or per shot adaptation, which is actually varying the resolution within a video based on what is playing. And that's sort of the next evolution of this. With that technique in live, you could, you could do that. You could, you know, if you're doing a football game, it might, if it takes you five seconds to figure out the right resolution, you might be five seconds behind, but, five, but then you can adapt to whatever the scene is. The other approach people are taking is kind of building a model ahead of time. So you could feed a lot of football footage or a lot of you know, e-gaming footage or whatever it is um, into a model and find the right model for that particular game and just apply it everywhere. Well, uh, so um, you can do it for both live and on demand. Um, but basically, on devices that support this, use a discontinuity tag between shots. Um, just, just like an individual, just like two videos might not need the same resolution, two scenes in the same video might not need the same resolution as well. So this sort of like next level, Netflix has a blog post on like dynamic optimizer, which is sort of their first analysis of this. Uh, and that's the approach. The others? Or? Yeah, so I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the ML approach to approximating the first title. So, mm -hmm. um, what is it taking as an input? Is it just taking the video at, a, at an encoding and doing a simple pass on it? Yeah, so um, I'm going to do my best as a non machine learning expert. Um, but uh, basically, we've built up a model. Um, First, we uh, use the YouTube Inception data set um, to uh, train a model on the attributes of a bunch of images. Um, and then we scan, I think our model has just like 1,000 videos in it today. But like theoretically, like our data scientist says, what you really want is like 100,000. So over time, we'll build up to that. But scan 1,000 videos for the low level attributes of the videos. So uh, I think we get out like 2,048 different like individual attributes of a frame. Uh, and then we weight those by importance, and you get this like, you know, array of like, I don't know, data vectors. And then a new video comes in. You kind of do that same pass, and then you match it against the model. Um, so the model is trained on the full, slow, uh, convex hulls, um, and then new videos are matched against that. Cool. Thanks, everyone.